so like uh, students uh, let me you know uh, formally uh, welcome uh, kausto uh, dargalkar very very close friend and you know has been teaching uh, at the wellinger institute when i was got first in touch with him now he is an independent consultant design thinking trainer coach and an innovation and strategy consultant author of it's logical is the title uh, innovating profitable business models sage publication uh, and serial entrepreneur since 1990 founded four companies and now on two more ventures in 2006 sold commercial interest in his first three companies and plunged into academics and research kausto relishes the challenge of enhancing the innovation quotient of an organization by helping create new offerings uh, to tap existing as well as new markets visualizing unique and sustainable business model and uh, some of the awards uh, are honored as entrepreneurship educator and mentor award by the ministry of skill development uh, then worked in the field of unconventional user research was acknowledged by the wharton school of business awarded the runner up award in the global wharton innovation tournament and his proposal on clean energy integration with electric vehicles was uh, adjudged as the top 7 in the world at the smart city world expo kausub has been teaching at idc along with me in some of our courses in design management and product planning so uh, kausub thank you so much and today you know you're the only one who's going to talk about the business model canvas as a, you know as a very important large domain you know uh, requirement for us we need to understand uh, the business model as you rightly said it's an extremely important uh, uh, area for us all right so broadly the agenda is uh, these four points i'm going to talk about uh, how the business model plays an extremely important role in uh, taking a venture forward keeping it sustainable keeping it alive for a long time and then i'm going to try and share some interesting or unique business models which kind of i have come across over the last 10 15 years and uh, practical kind of framework a six question framework uh, which uh, will help us look at our your own ventures and see if you can kind of create some unique uh, business model sustainable in the long run all right and then we will uh, touch upon the lean canvas and the business model canvas uh, with all these inputs so let me uh, dive in with 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 uh, an example with a case of uh, some of my students this is way back in 2013 cusp of 2013 14 um, one bunch of students was working on some something for speech and hearing impaired uh, people all right and the target segment i had deliberately given them was uh, very narrow speech and hearing impaired housewives not working ladies all right so and then they you know through their inquiry visits to those uh, their households and things like that uh, they observed some very uh, peculiar things very simple things on hindsight very simple things uh, they 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 went into the house to study the issues that these women face uh, when this lady was alone deliberately chosen the time when alone because uh, a lot of activities would be happening and there would be no help around so her real problems would real surface out uh, days went on days when even the housemaid was absent and this lady was alone managing her morning chores uh, 9:30 to 11 o'clock was the time that these uh, students of mine went in to do this uh, observational study and found very simple things whenever the doorbell would ring this lady would not be able to hear uh, when she would put something in the microwave and would go into some other room to do something else uh the microwave timer would time out and uh, this lady would it would keep beeping this lady would not be able to hear uh another interesting thing that we, these kids noticed was whenever she put something in the pressure cooker she would not leave the kitchen would pace around in the kitchen looking at the top of that cooker because if she thought if she left the room uh she would not be able to hear the number of whistles and maybe was worried the food might stay undercooked or get overcooked so she was constantly pacing around in the kitchen looking at that now with these few findings uh, these kids created this is the picture of the first prototype that they created all right it has a lot of nostalgia value for me because it is the first prototype printed on the 3d printer uh, in my lab way back in 2013 operation was very simple they inserted a bluetooth module in this device uh, and inserted corresponding bluetooth mobiles uh, modules in the appliances in the house 
so that they could communicate with each other in the sense that if the doorbell would ring the uh, wristband would vibrate and a red colored led would glow on it corresponding to the doorbell uh, if uh, the microwave would time out the wristband would vibrate and a bluish green colored led would glow on it uh, if the pressure cooker steamed out for the fourth time or fifth time as per the program uh, the wristband would vibrate and a blue colored led would glow on it so this was a simple first prototype product all right uh, back in 2013 14 uh, before wearables really became popular. Uh, interesting uh, product created in seven, eight days. Crude, but serves the purpose, all right? Now, two out of these five kids got excited about this idea, this concept. And they came to me one day saying, sir, we want to take it forward. Product refine karna hai and we have to take it forward. Uh, that means they wanted to create a product out of it and possibly, you know, venture around it. Uh, so I told them, uh, guys, uh, take about three, four weeks and look at the whole uh, market ecosystem check karo, and see what is the potential and things like that and, uh, and kind of create a broad roadmap that some milestones that you would like to meet in the next six months and then we will get going with how, what to do with it. All right. Two weeks went by, three weeks went by, these kids did not come back to me. After about five weeks, uh, both of them came back uh, one day with really unhappy with themselves. They said, uh, sir, we have analyzed that whole ecosystem. Market is good. Numbers are good. Though it's a niche market, there is a, if we refine it in multiple ways, the product will, will, uh, will, will be able to capture some market share. But two major problems. Problem number one is back in 2013, if one had to start a manufacturing unit in India, one needed something like 19 different licenses. And it would take anywhere between 15 to 20 months to get there. All right, problem number one. Problem number two, this product is so damn simple. It can be copied very easily, right? There is no great entry barrier in this. And they said, we might even get those 19 licenses. We might spend those 15, 20 months getting it. We might set up a unit. We might manufacture the first lot of, say, 1,000 pieces. Maybe we'll be able to sell it in Mumbai and around. But... Uh, Maybe what if the Chinese come in six months or seven months later with this product and they will come in with billions of pieces, at least 100,000 pieces and crash the price completely, right? Half to one fourth the price. And then we will be left nowhere. Everybody agrees? Two major issues? Yeah. 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 Yes. Now, I have a question for all of you. Now, knowing this, this is a product in front of your first prototype, my first version. And these two major hassles to take this product forward to the market. How many of you would go ahead with it? How many of you would not go ahead? Yes or no? So let's uh, look at it from an entrepreneurial perspective. And let us analyze the reasons why yes, why no. Patents. Patent, uh, I mean, let us look at this product. I mean, will we get a patent? A technology patent? Utility patent maximum. It's very difficult for a startup to get into all these wrangles, you know. Look and feel, utility and design. The, the shape can be registered. So exactly. patent milega. So patent milega bhi nahi, right? Control costs, yes, doable. Can we really beat the Chinese in terms of cost control? Tough, no? Right? Yeah, probably not. Yeah. Probably not, yeah. <laughs> right? But I think uh, there is a, you know, uh, with the costing and with the Chinese label, I think this has always been uh, uh, known that it's not durable or not reliable. So for someone who's uh, investing, I think we do have a sort of leverage here because reliability and trust, trust would be more as compared to Chinese products. Focus on reliability. All right. All right. Cool. Fair enough. Fair enough. Doable. Yes. But still that Chinese threat looms, right? It's, it might just throw you out of the market, correct? So that, that threat always exists. Aggressive marketing promotion, doable, but from a startup perspective, we really? don't have budgets to do that, right? Marketing aggressively needs a lot of money, right? You do promos on digital media, television, it consumes a lot of money. From a startup perspective, we don't have that those kinds of resources, correct? So... Doable, but difficult. Finding the right networks for outsourcing, etc. Once again, what is there in it? What stops the outsourcer only to manufacture it? 
Yeah, you outsource it from China and IPR laws in China are even worse. So there is a lot of, lot of iffiness about the whole thing, right? So, you know, these kids did not give up, two of them. After about six, seven weeks, they used to come, they used to meet. A lot of times they came and after about five, seven weeks, they came jumping into my office saying, sir, problem is not with the market. Problem is at our end. We can't manufacture it. So what if we don't manufacture it at all? Let us completely open source this technology. Anybody can manufacture it. It is so simple. Anybody can manufacture it. Let's open source it. Provided they have a, they use a standard Bluetooth module embedded in it. Then these guys came up with a brilliant idea. They said, forget about manufacturing. We will create a cloud platform. On one side, we will give out APIs to all these wristband manufacturers in the world. And on the other side, we will approach appliance manufacturers like Siemens and LG and Whirlpool, etc., and tell them that if your appliance connects to our cloud platform through our API, in the household, your electronic appliance can communicate with the wristband of any manufacturer and can solve the purpose for a deaf and mute individual everywhere in the world. Now, that's the power of the business model. And these guys created this cloud platform and now look at it from the business model. Now, let us analyze what happened. These guys went to these large corporations. First, they cracked Siemens. It took them six, seven months to do it. The proposition, value proposition that these large companies, they proposed to was, with this simple API, you can brand your product as an inclusive product, deaf and mute friendly product. Very true. And, and at what cost? Per API, they charge them something like 1.5 to 2 cents. Now, back in 2014-15, dollar was some 60 rupees. So 2 cents is what? What are we talking about? 12 paisa. Get it? Now, at that 12 paisa, this brand, big brand, gets to call its product a physically challenged, inclusive product. Big value proposition. And if you remember in 2015, 16, there was a huge trend across the world to make products, especially home appliances, as inclusive as possible. Right? So these guys very smartly wrote that curve. And suddenly their offering became a global offering. Then what they did was even better. They first con first onboarded with Siemens, took them six, seven, eight months to convince them, POC, ye sab karte karte, it took them time. But once Siemens got onboarded, naturally Siemens is a big brand, right? Samsung came on, became on board, Whirlpool came on board, LG came on board. And suddenly they became a global player only through this cloud platform, went away from their hassle of manufacturing completely. Later on, they did not restrict themselves to just connecting with bands for deaf and mute speech and hearing impaired people. But once they had the cloud platform in place, they added modules so that they got into home automation also. I mean, through your mobile phone, you can switch the geezer on, air conditioner on, off, whatever you want to do, right? So they kept on upgrading. And in 2017, they were acquired by Siemens ka home automation division for a good valuation of about 30, 32 crores. The whole platform that they developed. And so you get my point? So that's the significance of the business model. Their whole success journey began when they looked at the business model uh, uh, sharply by going the cloud model rather than a, a, a manufacturing model, right? And so, so this is, I would say, a classic case of what is typically called as a pivot or, you know, in startup jargon, it is called as a pivot. But classical case of how you pivot depending on market situations and how, how you create a win-win situation. It's a win-win situation for everybody. Right? So if you see the successful companies of the last 10, 15 years, most of them have created platforms around their product. They may have started with hardware, but they have soon surrounded their hardware with products, uh, with, with, uh, with a cloud platform where more and more services can be plugged in. Get it? 
so so and it's a classic case of thinking through the business model all right so this i just wanted to put it in perspective the significance of the business model all right so what what happened let us look at i mean they completely shifted their paradigm of thinking they figured out a different way to reach the same consumer and at a much higher scale right so that's one thing they went from manufacturing to cloud uh, think platforms as i mentioned once you think about creating a platform around your project uh, around your product what happens is typically now these guys entered that segment market segment with simple offering and they entered the household automation business right and they kept on adding more and more features such that more and more revenue stream started coming in but if they had not created a platform that that would not have been possible right so think beyond just hardware think what other uh, things you can add and that you can add when you think in terms of platforms get it and when you create a platform what happens is when other manufacturers or other service providers want to reach the same market segment they also join your platform and you get more avenues for monetization get it let me make it simpler with maybe another example all of you are aware of practo practo started with a simple application for fixing appointments with the between doctors and patients right simple normal application it benefited the doctor because doctor could get appointments even when his office or dispensary was closed 24 by 7 appointments could be booked patients could book appointments 24 by 7 not waiting for that 4 to 7 consulting time when the receptionist would pick up your call correct so total freedom now they entered the, the doctor market then they kept on analyzing what else do doctors need and they came upon the need that especially dentists dentists use a lot of material right so they carry a lot of inventory they use different you know all those blades rotors burrs and plus different materials for uh, you know for filling cavity filling etc so and it's a nightmare for a doctor whether he or she will focus on his practice or her practice or manage inventory for his uh, for his uh, uh, you know office for his for his uh, clinical practice so they introduced an inventory management software onto the plat practo platform correct so naturally loyalty of doctors they got then they also realized that these small nursing homes you know uh, 10 bedded or 15 bedded nursing homes which are run by surgeons they also carry a lot of inventory which the doctor can't possibly spend time managing inventory it's a specialized job so they plugged in some inventory management software onto the practo platform for the surgical homes then uh, gradually naturally their traction from the doctor started increasing then uh, uh, later on they also realized that doctors have a problem keeping accounts managing their accounts so they added some accounts management software module onto their platform see how they are gradually progressing now with this they are capturing the loyalty of these doctors now once the doctors are on their platform pharmaceutical companies who want to sell their medicines to doctors also became interested in promoting their products through practo get the point which means more avenues for monetization of that platform now today uh, pharmacies are also there on the practo platform wanting to sell to patients directly apollo pharmacy netmeds uh, pharmacy all of that they want to kind of there be there plus today it is now thanks to the pandemic they have become a pretty much developed video consultation platform correct so what is the lesson to learn from here they created a platform they created a loyal customer base and any other company or any other service provider which wants to sell their service to that customer segment doctors then use utilizes the practo platform to reach their reach to them right because practo has created a channel to reach to that market segment which other service providers also want to reach and naturally avenues for monetization keep on increasing so that's that's the beauty of uh, scale through platform creation so think keep that in mind when you think about taking your products to market all right though right now they may be pure hardware but think about it from the customer side what else what else can be done and 
leave those uh, you know modules open so that you can plug in more and more things on the platform cool so think platforms and of course as uh, design students you would all know this venn diagram right desirability feasibility viability uh, successful uh, you have to pivot till you are in the sweet spot now uh, the first risband guys when they had uh, uh, they were thinking of manufacturing the risband they had captured the user needs well they had figured out the operational and tech possibilities but if they had manufactured the wristband their business goals would not have been met right the moment they tweaked with that cloud model cloud platform model they came to the sweet spot so that's that's where that's how you should think about a business model that how can you bring your venture into the sweet spot and keep it there what technological changes or what operational changes you need to bring about in the way you are going to market that's where the business model plays a very important role right now uh, let me share with you as i mentioned uh, some little bit of my research of the last 10 12 years of how some businesses have kind of beaten their competition not really on the product or not really on the tech but on the structuring of their business model uh, first one which i call as double whammy uh hair express so javed habib a lot of bollywood celebrities were his customers sachin tendulkar was his customer and other sports people etc so his claim to fame was hair stylist to the rich and famous all right now if you were in javed habib's place probably by the end of the 90s that fellow realized that most of my business is restricted to my hand skills if i am not present i don't get these rich and famous customers right correct my bandwidth is limited how many hair styles that i can do in a day i have 24 hours 7 days a week i cannot expand expand beyond a certain point though large amount of brand equity goodwill was created in the 90s agreed so as a smart chap he thought in terms of scale how can he now utilize his brand equity and create a scalable model so somewhere in 2001 or 2002 he started his hair styling academy if you remember javed habib's hair styling academy or something he started so students would enroll to to learn hair styling would pay a fee to enroll to learn hair styling and couple of years later he started these hair express so salons about a, a year and a half to two later after he started his hair uh, academy training academy javed habib is in the middle suppose i am javed habib on my left side is my training academy where students pay money get enrolled learn hair styling from my uh, academy and on the right side i have this chain of salons where i deploy the same manpower some student interns do free do work for free so i am in the middle i am generating revenue from both sides of the value chain from my back end that is who's my employee technically in that salon majority of the employees who are they the students student right that employee is actually paying me a fee to get trained you get my point that's what i call as double whammy i am getting paid from both ends of the value chain interesting model no it's a skill it's a finger based personal skill he can't replicate it very easily so but with this he suddenly was able to scale up so getting paid from both ends of the value chain interesting model think about it then let me give you another example slightly tech based example duolingo everybody is familiar with duolingo yes right? yes so yes go to app store go to google play store or wherever you can download it and learn some foreign languages all right now duolingo what is duolingo's business model duolingo is actually a translation company which takes jobs for translation suppose i am duolingo and say one of you uh, suppose she is a japanese company wanting to enter india so what is one of the main tasks that her company would want to do would want to translate certain japanese documents into indian languages right in the english whatever 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 all right so i am doing why i take up that job of translation i break down those documents into small little words pieces bits and you know small little sentences disjoint everything is disjoint and you know how duolingo pushes the uh, tutorial into our phone it's a nice animated gamified kind of a tutorial right you all of you have seen it it is fun to play with 
Now, all these broken down words and sentences or whatever it is, are kind of a fancy, nice animation is created around it and is pushed down through the app store where hundreds of thousands of people who want to learn the Japanese language download it and keep on playing with it. Playing with it means what? What are you doing uh, when you're learning a new language, when all these words, sentences are sent in? What are you doing actually? Training, translating. Yeah. You're translating. And as you get better, you climb up level one, level two, level three, level four, whatever, whatever. It's a freemium model. And Duolingo has an intelligent algorithm at the back, which picks up the best translations from the crowd, stitches that entire document together, and gives it to Ananya's company, who pays me, who pays Duolingo. Once again, now being a freemium model in front, you get to download it free. For first seven, eight levels, you get to use it free. Then I monetize your presence. Either I make you subscribe to my uh, app or I push some in-app advertising or in-app videos through which I make money. And on the back end, I make money from the company for whom the translation has been done, which means I can kind of run that whole company without, without employing a large amount of translators. I need moderators, yes, to check whether the algorithm is generating the best translators, but my staff is minimized, correct? It's a very lean model. Once again, uh, uh, revenue from both ends of the value chain, double whammy. Now, in what kinds of situations can you use these? My, my learning from this is that if you are into some business, which you have a certain skill set for which there is a large demand in the market to learn that skill set, like hairstyling, there was a large demand to learn hairstyling. Uh, learning a new language. There is a large demand to learn that new language, right? In that case, you could possibly use some something like this, this kind of a business model. Yes. All right? Yes. Cool? Okay. Don't mistake it with a trader's kind of a model. Huh? This double whammy is different. Get it? Right? So Zomato is like a trader's model. You know, even a real estate broker makes money from the buyer as well as the seller. This is different. This is where a specific skill is in demand and the guy is creating a training academy and at the same time creating a franchised out store. So that's not a typical trader's model. Get my point? Right? Yeah. yeah. So otherwise, technically, even a real estate broker is a double whammy, right? I'm not, yeah. I'm not talking about that. I'm not. Javed Habib is outsourcing his labor from his own students, employees from his own students, whereas Duolingo is crowdsourcing the uh, labor force from people like you and me. Now, this is also interesting. Uh, NetJets uh, is a company based out of US. Uh, go back about 20 years. They, they sell private jets. Private jets. Now, who buys private jets? The rich and famous. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, say, uh, for, 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 for want of any nomenclature, uh, yes. let us call them 10 raised to 10 into super into rich. Yeah. Uh, being an engineer, uh, mathematical nomenclature, right? So, say R Ratan Tata, Mukesh Ambani, etc. Now, these guys, somewhere in the late 90s, early 2000s, realized that dunia mein how many people exist who can afford to buy an aircraft on their own? Not many. So, their revenues were not increasing as much as they would have liked to increase, correct? It's a limited, very small market. And kitna lega? I mean, you know, it can't expand beyond a certain point. So they said, uh, we, we need to relook at the way we operate. So they kind of did some bit of research and discovered that this 10 raised to 10 into super rich, ke niche bhi there is a segment, which is say 10 raised to 8 into rich. A very, very affluent. Say 10 raised to 10 is say Mukesh Ambani and Ratan Tata. 10 raised to 8 into rich is maybe, you know, uh, Harsh Mariwala of Mariko Industries or maybe a Kishor Biani of Future Group or some people like that. And now, why do people buy an aircraft? It's not just status, right? It is because these guys are really busy and they cannot really afford to wait for the commercial airline ka timetable. They want to fly at their beck and call. Agreed? Clear? Yeah. So even these 10 raised to 8 into rich varieties also equally busy. But they don't have the kind of cash flow in their business that they can, you know, suddenly pull out 300 crores from their business and buy an aircraft. But 
they need the aircraft get the get the understanding of the market the need is there but the means are not quite there so these netjets fellows said that we are losing this market can we tap this market in an interesting manner so they came up with a scheme of fractional ownership in the sense that they would kind of approach say five people from the 10 raise to 18 to rich segment i come to you and ask you boss uh, okay you can't shell out 300 crores in one go how much can you somebody says 65 somebody says 70 somebody says 55 and totally 300 crores okay all right and i sell you that aircraft in that proportion you own that aircraft in that proportion and the number of flying hours that you get per year are distributed according to your ownership all right clear now is there a problem with this model there could be um, overlaps yeah i have to find a solution for that mm -hmm. i have to give you another aircraft to fly so that your schedule does not get upset all right mm -hmm. now suppose now now this fractional ownership model may it is not only one group that i have sold one aircraft to i have sold 300 other aircraft to 300 other groups now from a from an entrepreneur's perspective how can you simplify your operations instead of having six seven different types of aircrafts in that fleet of 300 what if i introduce a common aircraft across all the 300 you want to minimize your hassle but you want to give the best customer service correct that's now, what indigo also did no indigo bought a same type of aircraft so they got less maintenance less uh, inventory less spares absolutely yeah. Yeah, so now with a common fleet, first of all, what is the benefit for you as NetJets? Suppose I had a fleet of 300, which had 50 Beechcrafts and 70 Cessnas and some 100 Dorniers, etc. So I will be dealing with three companies for procuring my aircrafts, right? Instead of that, if I'm dealing with only one aircraft company, aircraft manufacturer, and I am negotiating for 300 aircrafts, where will I get a better deal? That will be the better deal. Obviously, bulk negotiation is much easier and 5% saved on aircraft purchase is huge, right? Expensive asset. So that's one benefit. Secondly, as uh, Professor Chakravarti mentioned, maintenance costs when the fleet is uniform goes down. Even cost of uh, maintaining the pilots. Now, these NetJets fellows said that, gave the offer to these fractional owners that Guys, you don't worry about the pilots. You don't worry about in-flight crew. You don't worry about any kinds of inventory or any kinds of maintenance of the aircraft. We will do the maintenance, a uh, group of pilots. We will maintain uh, in-flight crew. We will maintain your aircraft, ground maintenance, everything we'll do, for, for which we will charge you a service fee. Fair model? These guys don't have to maintain any pilots, nothing. Now, now with this model, they cracked open a market segment which was not looking at them earlier, the 10 raised to 8 variety. So if you are kind of introducing some expensive products in the market, maybe fractional ownership can be looked at. And it's not just fractional ownership, but down the line, the entire business model needs to be thought through, right? All the operations, etc. Everything needs to be thought through very clearly. Got it? Another one, this is interesting. Uh, Xiaomi phones, how did they launch in the market whenever seven, eight years back? How did they launch? 100% online, no physical stores, right? Uh, because physical stores means you have to have wholesalers, distributors, retailers, and at every place you have to maintain certain amount of stock. Yeah. Whereas 100% online, your stocks can be managed better. Another thing they introduced was this flash sale business. Flash sales. Two minute window. Today they will announce on 31st December our new model will be launched at 12 o'clock and that sale will be over at two minutes past 12. Correct? That's how they launch, no? Flash sales? Yes? Now look at the advantages in terms of the business model, so to say. When, when today I announce, suppose I am Xiaomi, I announce I will my product will be available on Amazon and Flipkart on 31st December between 12 o'clock and 12, 2 past 12, which means I have made Amazon and Flipkart as my partners in the promotion, equal partners in the promotion, correct? So naturally, my promotional expenses of Xiaomi also get reduced to a certain extent, correct? 
That's one. Then, at the time of the sale, to catch that two-minute window, a lot of people stay logged in three, four hours in advance to catch that two-minute window. Now, that means there are a lot more eyeballs on that platform of Amazon and Flipkart in those three to four hours. Because of excessive footfall and excessive eyeballs, their banner advertising rates on the platforms get spiked up tremendously. Why have the banner advertisement rates got spiked up? Because of Xiaomi's two-minute uh, uh, flash sale. So these spiked up or additional revenue streams which come because of the additional revenue that comes in because of the bumped up advertising rates gets shared with Xiaomi also because Xiaomi is the cause for these rates getting spiked up. Agreed? Yes. Which means Xiaomi has saved on their marketing promotion activity in the beginning by making them partners by Amazon Flipkart partner. Plus, this additional bumped up uh, advertising revenue is also shared because of which now you realize why Xiaomi is able to sell a, a, a equivalent Android phone as a Samsung Galaxy, whatever, whatever at probably 60%, 65% of the cost. Get it? So what did Xiaomi do? They created a perceived shortage in the market. Now our goods are available only for two minutes. So it's not just a marketing gimmick. It's a whole business model structured around creating a perceived shortage. Get it? Now, this is a tech company. Let us look at some brick and mortar company like Zara. Zara has a 90-day fashion cycle. In 90 days, the fashions change, correct? That's how they run. Now, that is also creating a perceived shortage. There is a study uh, by, you know, there is this agency called Fitch, F-I-T-C-H, which, which publishes a lot of reports on the retail industry. A couple of years back, I remember reading a report by Fitch, which said, in Europe, a loyal customer of Zara visits a Zara store 17 times in a year, one seven, 17 times in a year. And who is Zara's competition? Marks and Spencer, H&M, etc. Loyal customers of these Marks and Spencer or H&M, etc. visit a Marks and Spencer store and H&M store only seven to eight times in a year as compared to a loyal customer of Zara visiting their store 17 times in a year. Plus, when you or I go into a Zara store and we know that something that we like, suppose we like some piece of some t-shirt or something or a shirt or something like that. And at the back of the mind, I know that when I come later, maybe 90 days later, this may not be available. So I have a tendency to pick up maybe two in different colors instead of one. Get it? See how that perceived shortage thing creates a completely different revenue stream, uh, a multiplied, the bumped up revenue, et cetera, et cetera. And what they smartly do is the 90-day cycles are not matched everywhere in the world. Whatever is kind of remaining unsold in Europe comes to Asia for the next 90-day cycle, then goes to Africa. Get it? So now... That's what, that's what I'm saying. It's a very planned, structured business at play. That's, that's the significance of the business, how we think through the business model. And this is not just gimmickry. Zara has perfected this over the last 40 years of their operations. 90-day cash, 90-day fashion cycle is not easy to manage, right? So their whole business is based on that. So that's, that's how business models can differentiate you from competition. All right, so I, I've just, just shared three, four traits of business models. More maybe you can read up. Uh, I have listed out in that uh, in the uh, in my book also. If you get time, maybe you can explore that. All these three, four uh, traits I said are about being here in the sweet spot. How to bring your venture at the sweet spot, right? And remain uh, competitive, uh, remain uh, uh, unique in the way you are operating, and possibly beat competition. All right, competition is going to copy you, so you need to constantly struggle to reach uh, to remain at a sweet spot. But these are some of the traits that one can experiment to kind of uh, be there. All right, so that's one thing. Now, as I said earlier, is there a framework? I told you these four or five stories, examples, fine, but is there a framework that one can ask oneself when you are trying to create a venture? How can you create a unique and a sustainable business model yourself? So I have these six questions 
which if you constantly keep asking yourself, you can maybe differentiate yourself on the basis of a business model. Okay, let us look at question one. How do we reach the customer? How do I reach the customer? Uh, look at the wristband guys. They reach the same customer in a completely different manner. Instead of manufacturing, they went the cloud platform model. So that's the answer. How can I reach the same customer? I have identified customer discovery. Who I actually I have identified a need. Will I enter the market the same way that my competitors enter, or should I try to do something else? Can I use some a different technology to reach the same customer? Can I use some different channel to reach the same customer? Got it? Next question: How do we optimize our operations? Let us look at Javed Abhi. Did he optimize his operations? By creating that double-sided, double whammy business model, he was able to provide labor at practically zero cost. And it's a closed loop kind of a model, right? No outsider can get entry there. Plus, the employee is actually paying me a fee to get trained. Yeah, so it's quite optimized. <laughs> and so this fellow, if you remember, he entered the market in 2005 or six or sometime. Other equivalent salons would charge something like 150 rupees a haircut, whereas this fellow entered the market at 99 rupees a haircut. Better quality, low price. That's So you need to optimize your operations to be able to manage that. Duolingo, same thing. By the crowdsourcing model, they were able to minimize their costs of translation to such a low price that nobody can really beat them at that cost, right? Plus, you use smart use of technology also intelligent algorithm to stitch up the document, right? So crowdsourcing is another way that you can optimize your operations. Uh, NetJets, by standardizing their fleet, they optimize their operations. Get it? In in the uh, Javed Abhi model, uh, when it was his skill set that he put across and he used his brand to uh, kind of optimize his operations, he also, in a way, in the long run, saturated the market in a way because there were also people who copied his model and then it kind of made him go out of the uh, limelight a little bit. So as a, as a business, yeah. uh, if I'm looking at such optimizations and if there is a potential uh, threat to my own business in a way where it's getting copied and it's getting multiplied in ways that I cannot control, um, then how is it benefiting me in the long run? All right. Now, first of all, let us remember one thing. If you introduce something good in the market, it is going to be copied. Correct? Yes? Absolutely. Why is it copied? Because it is doing well. Correct? Right. Yes. Or no? If it is not copied, then there are only two possibilities according to me. Either you are technically, technologically very, very superior to everybody else or you are the only fool in the market who continues to be in the market where there is no market existing, where competition doesn't think there is a market. True? So competition is actually a good thing, no? That's a classic case of not staying in the sweet spot and thinking that ek bar mene business model kar diya to lifelong success is guaranteed. Never happens like that. Get it? So you constantly have to explore to always remain in the sweet spot. And what are the questions that you need to ask constantly? These are six questions that you need to ask constantly to remain in that sweet spot. Get it? So shall I go to the next point? How do we source our manpower? Right? Let me again go back to Duolingo. How did they source their manpower? Crowdsourcing. How did Javed Abib source his manpower? Training Academy. Right? How does an Ola or an Uber source their manpower? Freelance drivers, right? Freelancers. Now, because it is a freelance model, their fixed costs are practically zero. It is purely a variable cost. Driver jitna gadi chalaega, utna paisa usko dega. So it is linked to the revenue that is generated. Smart way of sourcing manpower. Crowdsourcing by Duolingo, smart way of sourcing manpower. IKEA also, IKEA. Uh, IKEA, by the sheer number of designs that it comes out with, they must be having a solid big design team sitting in Sweden. That's the impression. Yes. Now, 
the kind of designs, the number of designs that IKEA churns out, one can imagine they must be having a huge design team sitting in Sweden, possibly. Yeah, right? yeah. That's the impression. Now, a designer in Sweden, Europe, probably the fifth or the fourth most expensive country in the world, Sweden. If you have a team of 200 designers sitting there, it's going to be a big cost for IKEA, correct? So how does it source? It has a constant competition that is rolling on their website for designers from the world to upload their designs, right? Which means they are once again converting their fixed cost into variable costs. Yes or no? Yeah. Man, the designs which are coming in large numbers and anybody who wants to have his or her design in the IKEA catalog, anybody and everybody wants. A wannabe designer would want. It's a big thing on the CV of that designer, right? So they attract good folks around. So that's the way they source their manpower. Plus, interestingly, by the DIY model, do-it-yourself model, what has IKEA done? They have been able to eliminate a lot of their back-end carpenters and fitters, right? Who is their labor? The customer. customer <laughs> we are their manpower. So that's a smart way of sourcing manpower. And that's also the power of design. Everything is standardized. Any donkey can assemble an assembly uh, IKEA furniture. So they have simplified it, dumbed, dumbed, dumbed it down to that thing, right? How do we source our inputs? What are the inputs required for the business? Say Ola, Uber, what is the main input vehicle? Vehicle is the main input for their business. Where do the vehicles come from? How do they source the vehicles? Freelance manpower brings in their vehicles. So it becomes an asset light model in normal terms. Asset light means I don't invest in physical assets. I source assets and I kind of become an aggregator. So there's a smart way to source inputs. Right? How many creative ways can you source your inputs? Ask yourself that question. All right? What kinds of tie-ups should we seek? What kinds of tie-ups should we seek with the customers, with the vendors, with the suppliers? What kind of a tie-up does Uber or Enola have with the driver? It's a very loose tie-up, no? There's no binding. You have to stay logged in for the whole day, 24 hours, nothing like that. Whenever you feel tired, you can log off. Plus, it is so loose that if an Uber driver wants to shift to the Ola app, that for that freedom is also there. Then, uh, what is the kind of tie-up that uh, NetJets sought with its customers? There is a service level agreement also. We will provide you the service of maintenance. We will provide you pilots. We will provide you in-flight crew. We will provide you ground maintenance, all of that. For that, you give us a service fee. So that's a different kind of tie-up. Then how do we create an optimal product mix? Optimal product mix means maybe at the beginning, you are a single product company. But as you grow, you have multiple products in your portfolio. And all products will not sell equally. You, there will be some products which will sell more, some products which will sell less or something like that. And you can't take a decision purely on financial terms. A very crude example, suppose you're running a restaurant. Uh, your uh, profit margins on uh, butter chicken and paneer butter masala are high. Your profit margins on roti are not as high, suppose. Can you stop manufacturing <laughs> roti? You can't. <laughs> so, <laughs> the, there are complementary products, right? So you have to think about your product mix in an optimal kind of a fashion. Now, let us go back to this IKEA thing. IKEA operates in some 50, 60 countries in the world, right? Probably more, all right? And they are, they are functioning across cultures, correct? They are selling to different cultures. Now, uh, their designs also need to be kind of match the cultural choices, preferences of various regions that they operate in. Now, because of this contest model, naturally, the cultural choices and preferences get embedded into, into their designs. Because suppose now IKEA wants to say enter some new geography. It will pick up designs coming from designers from that region to be included in their catalog, right? So naturally that optimal product mix kind of gets Done. embedded into their whole model. So. Yeah. These are six very basic questions that you need to constantly ask while you are thinking about your business model. In fact, not just while you're thinking about your business model, I think 
all through the life of the venture, you should ask these questions. And if you constantly keep asking these questions, if you can get answers which are different from what your competition is doing, then you will be able to create differentiation based on your business model in the market. Get it? All right. Cool. Having said all this, now let us come to your Lean Canvas. Now, just one or two subtleties that I want to bring into this Lean Canvas are customer segments, listing down your customer segments here, then identifying who the early adopter is. I just want to bring in one small, small nuances into the whole thing. When you're thinking about your early adopters, uh, who are your early adopters? How have you determined your early adopters? People who are in dire need of the product and not, they don't want it, but they need it. All right. Dire need and who are willing to experiment with the new product. Correct. So that's a classical definition of any, any marketing book will tell you. Dire need and willingness to experiment. Correct. I am I am putting you uh, putting you all into a real situation. Suppose I am manufacturing uh, rainwater harvesting systems. Okay, who is my who are my customer segments? Households which uh, where the little water very little like like Chennai. Chennai is desperate for water. So industry manufacturing industry especially. Yeah, yeah, who will pay huge amount of money? Water huge consumption industry. Huge, right? huge consumption and they pay commercial rate for water. So they they face a lot of uh, expense for water manufacturing companies right by default i am saying housing complexes then commercial institutions hotels hospitals blah 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 yeah uh, farmers who uh, have tie ups with mncs like mcdonalds and are growing cash crops for us. Okay. all right all right so these are now my possible market segments right out of them who will be my early adopters now i have to narrow down between the two as a startup i possibly can't focus on all market segments so i have to determine my early adopter right now uh, out of manufacturing companies and house owners i have to decide you have to take a call right that's my early adopter i have to decide today uh, who i will focus my promotional marketing efforts on who is more experimentative and who has the money to spare to experiment correct manufacturing companies possibly now, now let me put a slight twist in the story. Suppose I live in a commercial complex with 8-10 buildings. Each building is probably about 15-20 stories high. And my father sits on the managing committee of these, this housing complex. And the housing complex is thinking of rainwater harvesting system. As a startup, who should be my earlier adopter, manufacturing company or? I think housing complexes, because even if we take a little bit of money from everyone who's living in the building, it could generate a large amount. Plus, yeah. because I have a decision maker sitting on yeah. that building. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's the low hanging fruit. So from a startup perspective, doesn't this become my, should this not be my early adopter from a practical perspective? It would be easier to crack uh, yeah. when you're approaching the house owners. So if you think like a startup, I will go with housing complexes because getting that order might not be difficult. And I also see that there are 10 other complexes around where I stay, each with 8-10 buildings. If I prove my concept in this, that market is waiting for me. Now, if I were to go very theoretically, I would say, no, no, manufacturing companies is my early adopter. But to develop that market, it will take me six months to a year to be able to exploit that market, correct? So in your ventures also, please take a call based on your reach and the practicality of the situation. Don't just go by theoretical definition, all right? So that's, that's just one thing I want you to think about when you fill out your lean caps. Fair enough? As a startup, you want to kind of encash or you want to generate cash flow soon enough. Because we are not sitting on piles of cash, like an Ambani will sit, probably he'll make losses for five years, he won't care a damn about it. And later, sixth year, hence, he will think of cash flow. We are not in that position as a startup. Agreed? Okay, then you have these three problems to be listed out. Then for those three problems, what are the existing alternatives? Who is the competition? How are customers solving their these problems as of now? How are they solving it? Okay, clear. Then solutions for those problems, think, taking into account these existing alternatives also, correct? Uh, no need of going deeper in that, right? Already done. Now, now comes the channels part. Now here, 
is somewhere I feel a little more of detailed attention should be given. What are channels? According to me, there are three types of channels. First type of channel is how will you take your product or service to the customer? That is, what is your sales channel? How will you ensure delivery to the customer? How will you ensure trials of your product before delivery? Important. You have to ensure trials. Okay. Unless people are enabled to try out your product, they will not buy it. And after having bought it, if they are not satisfied, are there any channels that you are thinking about returning the product or service? Correct. Second, what will be your marketing channels? That is, how will you generate awareness? How will you ensure discovery of your product? How will you ensure engagement of your customer segment with your product? How will you capture feedback from them? How will you, eval how will you enable them to evaluate your product? So awareness means, do I go Insta via Instagram? Do I go via social media, search engine optimization, SMO, SEO, all that kind of stuff. Uh, discovery also is a similar thing on what channels do I use to enable my customer to discover me? Do I go print media? Do I go TV advertising? Blah, 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 all that kind of thing. Engagement with the customer segment, right? Engagement can be created in interesting ways. Uh, in the sense that uh, a bullet Enfield, they have these clubs of Enfield owners or Harley Davidson owners. Does the company spend any money on that? No, sir. No. But that's a classic case of voluntary engagement with the brand because those groups actually do a lot of promotion for you. They will go to Ladakh and say, oh, proud owners of Bullet and Field. They will flash pictures all along media, etc. Free promotional activity. Engagement. That's how you create engagement. You, you create competitions. Uh, you know, you, you create competitions for people to kind of participate. Free of cost publicity plus engagement with customers and virality assume. Got it? Right. How do you capture feedback from customers? That also, you have to think about the channels also uh, because feedback is very important. And feedback channels where customers can give anonymous feedback, even better, right? Get honest feedback, right? Next, third type of channels is how will you make your customer pay? Will you have a subscription model? Will you have a lease model? We will, will you have a pay-as-you-use model? Will you have a pay per use model? Pay as you use means uh, as the customer is use, like a typical SaaS model, software as a service, cloud models. Uh, pay per use is typically subscription models, or pay per use is like a if you take a, a, a public transport from A to B, you are paying per use. You're not paying as you, but if you take a taxi from A to B, you are paying as you use the number of kilometers traveled, right? So, how do you make your customer pay? You could have a combination of these channels. So don't treat channels just as you know means of reaching out, but think of channels in these three perspectives. You'll be able to get deeper into your business model. All right. And uh, then it is about the metrics, key metrics. This also must have been discussed. Metrics are those uh, performance parameters which will help you track your business, whether I am successful, am I on the right track or not? So what are these types of metrics? One is your revenue metrics. Am I meeting my revenue targets per month, per quarter or whatever? Uh, then is customer acquisition metrics. How many customers that downloaded my app actually bought my services? So that's acquisition, right? This could be in terms of reach or conversions. How many uh, hits did my page get? How many comments or how many likes did my post get? So these could be metrics to kind of check out customer acquisition, right? And of course, there are operational metrics. That means what is the level of inventory I'm maintaining? Am I maintaining my costs under 20% of the selling price or not? So these are basically parameters that you need to keep on monitoring 
to remain in that sweet spot. Remember that sweet spot? So what are the metrics that you need to constantly monitor to be able to remain sustainable at all times and be on the right track at all times, right? Uh, these were some nuances would I, which I would like to add in the Lean Canvas. Otherwise, revenue streams, cost structure, fixed costs, operational costs, all that must be already clear to you guys, right? So three, I'll just repeat, choose your early adopter properly. Uh, think about channels in these three uh, different, different channels, three different channels. Think about them in uh, those ways. And uh, as far as metrics are concerned, once again, three types of metrics, revenue metrics, customer acquisition metrics, operational efficiencies, and if there are any other metrics which are specific to your business. All right. As far as the Lean Canvas is concerned, these are my inputs. And I'm sure uh, you know that the Lean Canvas is created only for one customer segment at a time, right? Uh, you will, that means the number of customer segments that you are targeting, those many Lean Canvases you will generate, correct? All right. Now, which means one Lean Canvas per customer segment, right? Then combine all the lean canvases into one business model canvas, which is this, this is the business model canvas. All right. Now, listing out all the customer segments from your various lean canvases. What kinds of relationships do you have with each of these customer segments? That means maybe some customer segments you have a subscription model with, some customer segments you are uh, have a paper use model. Yes. You have to combine all those lean canvases into this, right? Uh, what is the value proposition for each customer? Seg is it different for different customer segments? So list down all the value propositions here. Get it? The channels through which I take the value proposition to the customer segments, once again, to be picked up from these channels here. These channels, yes. And combined into this column here. Get it? So if you have written down customer segments using different colors, say customer segment one in red color, customer segment two in green color, corresponding entries for relationships, value propositions and channels, green, red, blue, just use that uh, kind of uh, combinations. All right, so it helps you differentiate, got it? Uh, now all this side is done, revenue streams, again, cost structure, same, combined from different customer segments, right? Now comes this side. To do all these things on the right side, to create this value proposition, what are the key activities that you need to perform? What are the key resources that you will need? And who are the key partners that you will need to tie up with? That has to be listed here. Key activities means to say, manufacture XYZ. That's your key activity, setting up a manufacturing plant or tying up with an XYZ uh, source to get it manufactured. So, or I need to promote my product through these, these channels. So a key activity is creating a proper media plan, social media plan, digital media plan, et cetera. So that's your key activity. Key resources that I need to make this happen. Uh, to distribute my product, do I need to tie up with retailers, wholesalers, distributors? To set up a manufacturing plant, I need to identify certain resources that I need to tie up with, etc. So basically, everything that is required to, to build this value proposition, right? And key partners means, who will you tie up with? Which are the distributors that I will tie up with? Which are the wholesalers that I will tie up with? Which are the uh, e-commerce platforms that I will tie up with? Which are the payment gateways that I will tie up with to enable uh, this payment, uh, you know, these, these things here, yeah? If, if it is a pay-per-use model, if it is a subscri subscription model, uh, I will have to set up payment gateways and various mechanisms to make it happen. I will, as, as we looked at, uh, you know, Xiaomi tying up with uh, Flipkart and Amazon. So that Amazon Flipkart become a key partner here. So all this, these three blocks get dictated by what you do on the right side here. Get it? Now, the business model canvas, yes, of Karnega use kya hai? It kind of depicts your business model on one page. 
suppose you are pitching to an investor or pitching to your mentors or pitching to your bosses in a corporate environment that person doesn't have time to go through multiple lean canvases right so this is a tool to visualize your entire business model and depict it on one slide one single page single paper so it's a communication tool but the lean canvas is more of a tool that enables you to think right get the point and these questions are really really the ones that you may make that make you think and those answers that you get that you can fill up the lean canvas with answers to these questions will dictate what you fill up on the lean canvas and you will combine all of that into a business model canvas get it yes so understand don't get scared about what is a business model canvas according to me it's a simple tool which graphically puts your business model on one play in on one page and enables the audience to understand it in one glimpse lean canvas helps you get into each customer segment deeply and these questions really make you think about how you should structure your business so sequence should be first ask these questions then construct lean canvases for different customer segments and then combine it into one business model canvas and also when we do a startup we actually look at one customer segment very closely do the startup and then go to the Correct. other customer segments right yes. so that you at least get to know one very very closely yeah and also we have limited resource as a startup right we can't yeah. possibly carpet bomb multiple customers we can't handle yeah also do we see any one canvas from the students if they have made one lean canvas yeah, yeah, any of you want to share your lean canvas uh, with also at least one 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 you know only volunteer so basically sir uh, when we took this customer consumer feedback and also for, you know the target user feedback so we got to know ki the maximum of the buying of the backpacks for the kids are happening through a retail store only the man, not many people are going for a online thing and and there are a lot of reasons for it also you know why they are not buying it through online platform and also there is a lot of uh, confusion regarding the size of the bag what is the size that actually you know fits the bag you know a child when it's carrying so what we did we tried to you know focus on the consumer group that is from 3 to 12 years of age of a kid matlab that will include your play group to fifth class standard students that we tried to target right now and then accordingly when we came to this level we you know consumers are not much aware you know see what quality and what size is actually you know will go for the kid and they mostly go for the aesthetic and the price of the bag so so our problem statement was like you know ki uh, making something uh, because there is no such thing regarding a particular and what happens when you see, when you see the online platform also like amazon or a flipkart so there is no particular uh, dedicated platform where they can actually get the right information when they are buying the bag from online also so what happens if if a bag is there so they can't tell ki actually you can keep you know 5 to 10 notebooks into it there is no image such that they put any image they don't put any image like that which shows that you know they can carry they can put that much number of books or it can be organized or what is the fit you know actually if you see if you see the height ratio of the height and the bag ratio of a kid so that also that image is not there so it becomes very tough for a consumer to imagine that thing he what will be the right size and what will be the right bag for their kid and usually what happens most of the buying are done by the mother itself you know mothers are more involved in buying the bag so our solution was you know making a dedicated a uh, platform that is actually dedicated for a bags only you know backpacks only and with the certain matlab uh, like a quiz like a filter you know where if somebody enters into that website or a platform they can actually it will go like a quiz you know uh, how matlab what, what is the age of a kid if she male or female or what standard they're studying what is the color they like like that when they will come to a conclusion when all the quiz when all the answers all the questions will be answered then at the end of the day, at the end of that uh, quiz we will try to focus on that four or five bags that fulfills that you know customer ka need and accordingly what we can do at the down at the down when you down when you go down in the website we can show the competitive analysis you know 
but different bags are available in the market with the same price matrix and how when what I mean, there are there are certain parameters through which you can decide you know there is a material then there is size then there is a functionality of the bag so all these parameters can be set into it so so they can see you know if you see amazon pay when you go to buy a laptop so when you scroll down it show you know what different type of laptops are available in that range with a different brand and what features it contains and what which it doesn't contain and also one thing is that came to our mind you know there is no end product of the bag so ultimately what happens when you when the bag life cycle gets over you tend to throw it so there is no recycling as such happening in it so we came with this thing you know you can give us a bag that you want to don't that you don't want to you know throw it or something like that we will recycle the bag and with that thing we will give you a reward point accordingly you know and with that reward point actually you can buy more bags from our platform or if you refer that thing at the same time you know you can get more reward points accordingly and you can buy more bags of so that will also give a sense of you know a fulfillment that you know okay that bag has not gets some somebody has it has been recycled in that cycle and there are multiple problems no gaurav yeah. the, what's your core problem you're solving is it the buying experience you're solving or is it the buying if, if you're solving a buying experience you're making a you know uh, that's one one story no because though yeah. yeah 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 it i mean the problem statement ekdam clarity has to be ekdam spot on otherwise uh, many a time what happens is uh, a typical product market fit we are not able to achieve uh, and close to i think uh, some research i was reading some close to 40 45% of the startups fail because they haven't got the product market correct so uh, kausto thank you so much for this very very wonderful uh, you know like uh, you know with examples it was really nice and thanks for thank such you. a nice session thank session. you so much also, thanks again bye bye, bye. all the bye. best to you